Our text today is from the Gospel reading. And the Pharisees came unto Jesus and began to seek of him a sign from heaven. A car full of us students were returning to college after the Christmas vacation. It was the middle of the night, Highway 16 out of Milwaukee, barreling along as fast as the old Pontiac would go, when suddenly the hood flew up, shattered the windshield, obscured the vision, and scared the daylights out of us as the car skidded and screeched and swerved. And finally came to a halt, halfway in the ditch. We were a subdued group for a few moments, till Carl, a kid from Ann Arbor, broke the silence. It's a sign from God. What? It's a sign God doesn't want us to go back to school. Others said, no, no, it's a sign God wants us to stop driving these pieces of junk and invest in a decent car. Back and forth it went the last 40 miles. And when we reached the campus, Carl cleaned out his locker, so we never heard from him again. That's why our ears perk up when we hear them asking Jesus for a sign. For that search for a sign has continued through all the years since. Some signal to point the way. Some direction. Some sign to lead us through these confusing lives of ours. What sign do I have that I will recover my health? Or am I doomed to go limping along with a physical infirmity? If I study hard in school, is that a sign the scholarship will come through and I may continue my career? How will I know when I meet the person of my dream? What sign that I will live happily ever after? Or am I far better off staying single? If I work hard at my job every day, is that a sign that I will prosper financially? Or will the outfit go belly up and I find myself out on the street without a job? We can understand it entirely when they come to Jesus and ask for a sign, some sign, any sign, to show us which way we are to go. Jesus and his friends had just made a journey to the far boundaries of their land, Tyre and Sidon up in the north, Decapolis, a remote region on the far side of the sea. And now they've sailed back to Galilee, Dalmanutha, the very heart of their homeland. And no sooner do they step out of that boat when they are met by a phalanx of opposition, Pharisees and Herodians. And with faces as hard as flint, they put a question to Jesus designed to belittle his former work and to discredit him in the eyes of the crowd. Show us a sign from heaven. It's hard to say exactly what they meant by that. They had seen other signs and were not impressed. Jesus restored to health a man with a withered hand, but to complain that he did that work of healing on the Sabbath day of rest. He said, for your man possessed with devils, but they said, he does it with the devil's power, who builds of a prince of the devil. Or were they saying something else? Yeah, yeah. We heard how you fed the multitudes, 
out there in the wilderness. But that's nothing. Moses did the same thing for our father on their march through the wilderness. Gave them manna to eat every single day. The emphasis seems to be, give us a sign from heaven. Something celestial, sensational, awe-inspiring. Like Joshua, who commanded the sun and the moon to stand still on that longest day of battle. Like Samuel, calling down lightning and hailstones upon the Philistine army. Like Elijah up there on Mount Carmel, calling down fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice and the stone altar. Like Isaiah, who prayed that the shadow on the sundial of Ahaz go backward ten degrees. Give us a sign from heaven. And you know something? They were right. <laughs> there was nothing spectacular about the miracle Jesus did. The first one, get this, was at the wedding reception in Cana. When the refreshment ran out. And he turned water into wine. But how is that important in the larger scheme of things? Even feeding the multitudes out there in the wilderness, he used what was at hand, coarse brown bread baked from barley flour, the grain you give to livestock, and a few salted and dried fish. And impress you? No, no. Americans would want to know. Where's the mustard and the ketchup and the onions and the pickles and the tomatoes and the lettuce and the mayo? And if you ain't got it, we're going to a McDonald's. There was that loneliness about him all his life. From his birth as the cattle shed of Bethlehem, those years in the dusty carpenter shop of Nazareth, Traveling down the dusty roads and narrow streets on sandaled feet, crossing the lake in a stinking fishing boat, and finally enters the holy city. Not on a white stallion, a royal chariot, but on the colt of a donkey, and a borrowed one at that. He freed his followers from fear, anxiety, worry of the future. By what? Pointing them to the gross national product? The military protection of the Roman legions? Bigger bank accounts and pensions? No, no, no. He pointed them to the fowl of the air whom the heavenly father feeds. And to the lilies of the field whom the heavenly father clothes. And reminded them, not one hair falls from your head without the Father's permission. Jesus didn't view the world from heaven. Don't you get it? The way we watch the disasters of war and floods and hurricanes on television. From a distance. Or the way a bombardier looks through the crosshair, watches the puffs of smoke far below, and never sees a mother trying to shield her child from the flames, or the walls of a hospital caving in on the helpless. Jesus left heaven. For earth to become like us and with us and for us in our hunger and thirst, our weariness and loneliness, our sickness and our dying. 
shoulders at our side the same injustice and suffering that you and I must endure. Give us a sign. Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit. It hurt him. But he found no faith where he most expected it. Up there in the heathen territory, a Sidonian woman astonished Jesus with her great faith and he praised her for it. The half-breed over there in Decapolis spent three days in his company hanging on every word, oblivious to the passing of time and their physical discomfort. But here, among his own good religious countrymen, give us a sign from heaven. And Jesus says, I'm telling you the truth. This generation ain't going to get a sign. And he didn't give them one. You see, if signs are your bag, then you're going to have a problem with Jesus. He never once used a sign to advertise himself, assert himself, advance himself, or save himself. If he was trying to draw attention to himself, then he's doing it all wrong. He should have staged his miracles in the marketplace, rented out a coliseum as the evangelists do. Should have enough. I will be doing miracles tomorrow at the public library from 12 noon to 4 p.m. But he didn't do it. And not only that, he did it for the nobody. I mean, people so obscure, their names don't even appear on the program. That unnamed leper who rushed into the crowd, that anonymous woman who crept up on behind him to touch his garment, that lad whom they lowered through a hole in the roof. And by the way, what do signs prove? If you narrowly escape a bad car accident, what do you say? Boy, the brakes held. You're in a tight spot. And a check comes in exactly the right amount. What then? That so-and-so finally paid me back. If some miracle drug comes on the market to help you, what do you say then? Do you thank your lucky stars or the scientists who are working in some medical laboratory? What if the sun sets tonight and the stars come out? What does that prove to you? That Einstein's theory of relativity is still in operation. People who should have died still walking around. What's it mean? Did the x-rays, the medical records get mixed up? If I were to see somebody walking on the water from French Island to La Crosse, I don't think I'd call that a miracle. I would poke my wife in the ribs and say, how did he do that? Or say, hey there, let me see you do it again. All signs are ambiguous. Now, the problem with miracles is, they surprise you, they astonish, they amaze you. They make goosebumps, they hair to stand on and stimulate your nerve and But one thing miracles never do. They never touch your heart. They never cause you to repent. They never change the way you treat your spouse, do your job, pay your bills, spend your free time. That's why Jesus blows them off. You want a sign from heaven? about what God thinks of you 
and plans for you and expects from you, then look at Jesus, who is, in Bible language, the express image of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is your sign from heaven. Now you're going to demand a sign and tell him what to do. Are you going to commit yourself and surrender your life to him no matter what? Yonder sits the man Job, his family, his health, his life, broken down and ruined on all sides. And Job is saying, though God slay me, yet will I trust him. Now that's faith. Here's the psalm trying to cope in the evil day. My feet were almost gone. My steps had wild and I slipped. Nevertheless, thou hast holden me by my right hand. Here's the young David who faced the worst that this life can throw at a man, saying, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Here's Isaiah in the last dark days before the end. Though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Jacob acknowledges not, doubtless thou art our father and our redeemer. From of old is your name. Here's St. Paul. Sitting in a Roman prison house asking what? A jailbreak? I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, here's Jesus in the horror that engulfed him from Gethsemane to Calvary. Father, not my will, but thine be done. And finally, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. That's what faith is, and that's what faith does. Amen. Give us a sign from heaven. And you know something? They were right. <laughs> there was nothing. Spectacular about the miracle Jesus did. The first one, get this, was at the wedding reception in Cana when the refreshments ran out and he turned water into wine. But how is that important in the larger scheme of things? Even feeding the multitudes out there in the wilderness, he used what was at hand, coarse brown bread baked from barley flour, the grain he gave to livestock, and a few salted and dried fish. And impress you? No, no, Americans would want to know, where's the mustard and the ketchup and the onions, and the pickles, and the tomatoes, and the lettuce, and the mayo, and if you ain't got it, we're going to a McDonald's. There was that loneliness about him all his life. From his birth as a cattle shed of Bethlehem, those years in the dusty carpenter shop of Nazareth, traveling down the dusty roads and narrow streets and sandaled feet, crossing the lake, in a stinking fishing boat, and finally enters the holy city. Not on a white stallion, a royal chariot, but on the colt of a donkey, and a borrowed one at that. He frees his followers from fear, anxiety, worry of the future. By what? 
point them to the gross national product, the military protection of the Roman legion, bigger bank accounts and pensions. No, no, no. He pointed them to the fowl of the air whom the heavenly father feeds and to the lilies of the field whom the heavenly father clothes and reminded them not one hair falls from your head without the father's permission. Jesus didn't view the world from heaven. Don't you get it? The way we watch the disasters of war and floods and hurricanes on television from a distance. Or the way a bombardier looks through the crosshair, watches the puffs of smoke far below, and never sees a mother trying to shield her child from the flames. Or the walls of a hospital caving in on the helpless. Jesus left heaven for earth to become like us and with us and for us in our hunger and thirst, our weariness and loneliness, our sickness and our dying. Shoulders at our side, the same injustice and suffering that you and I must endure. Give us a sign. Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit. It hurt him. But he found no faith where he most expected it. Up there in the heathen territory, a Sidonian woman astonished Jesus with her great faith and he praised her for it. The half-breed over there in Decapolis spent three days in his company hanging on every word, oblivious to the passing of time and their physical discomfort. But here, among his own good religious countrymen, give us a sign from heaven. And Jesus says, I'm telling you the truth. This generation ain't going to get a sign. And he didn't give them one. You, you see, if signs are your bag, then you're going to have a problem with Jesus. He never once used a sign to advertise himself, assert himself, advance himself, or save himself. If he was trying to draw attention to himself, then he's doing it all wrong. He should have staged his miracles in the marketplace, rented out a coliseum as the evangelists do. Should have announced, I will be doing miracles tomorrow at the public library from 12 noon to 4 p.m. But he didn't do it. And not only that, he did it for the nobody. I mean, people so obscure, their names don't even appear on the program. That unnamed leper who rushed into the crowd, that anonymous woman who crept up on behind him to touch his garment, that lad whom they lowered through a hole in the roof. And by the way, what do signs prove? If you narrowly escape a bad car accident, what do you say? Boy, the brakes held. If you're in a tight spot. And a check comes in exactly the right amount. What then? That so-and-so finally paid me back. If some miracle drug comes on the market to help you, what do you say then? Do you thank your lucky stars? Or the scientists who are working in some medical laboratory? What if the sun sets tonight and the stars come out? What does that prove to you? That Einstein's theory of relativity is still in operation? 
People who should have died still walking around. What's it mean? Did the x-rays, the medical records get mixed up? If I were to see somebody walking on the water from French Island to La Crosse, I don't think I'd call that a miracle. <laughs> I would poke my wife in the ribs and say, how did he do that? Or say, hey there, let me see you do it again. All signs are ambiguous. Now, the problem with miracles is, they surprise you, they astonish you, they amaze you. They make goosebumps, they hair to stand on and stimulate your nerve and But one thing miracles never do, they never touch your heart. They never cause you to repent. They never change the way you treat your spouse, do your job, pay your bills, spend your free time. That's why Jesus blows them off. You want a sign from heaven about what God thinks of you and plans for you and expects from you? Then look at Jesus, who is, in Bible language, the express image of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is your sign from heaven. Now you're going to demand a sign and tell him what to do. Are you going to commit yourself and surrender your life to him no matter what? Yonder sits the man Job, his family, his health, his life, broken down and ruined on all sides. And Job is saying, though God slay me, yet will I trust him. Now that's faith. Here's the psalm trying to cope in the evil day. My feet were almost gone. My steps had wild and I slipped. Nevertheless, thou hast holden me by my right hand. Here's the young David who faced the worst that this life can throw at a man, saying, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Here's Isaiah in the last dark days before the end. So Abraham be ignorant of us, and Jacob acknowledges not. Doubtless thou art our father and our redeemer. From of old is your name. Here's St. Paul, sitting in a Roman prison house, asking what, a jailbreak? I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, here's Jesus in the horror that engulfed him from Gethsemane to Calvary. Father, not my will, but thine be done. And finally, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. That's what faith is, and that's what faith does. Amen.